Okay, so we've already now covered uh, hereditary integrals, uh, and I want to talk today about a topic called the correspondence principle. Um, so the goal of what we're what we're shooting for today, let me write this down. Our goal, okay. Our goal is to develop a method to apply viscoelastic concepts to traditional uh, structural problems. It won't apply to every uh, problem, but it's going to apply to many of them. Okay, so our goal is to develop a method um, uh, to apply uh, viscoelastic principles or concepts, rather. Um, to uh, traditional mechanics problems, at least some subset of them. And the, the method that we're going to come up with, I'll give you a preview, that is the correspondence principle. Okay. So we'll define it more formally here in just a little bit. So I want to say up front that I'm not going to derive the correspondence principle in a rigorous mathematical fashion. I'm going to consider a really simple problem. We're going to work through it and show that uh, this principle holds, and then we're going to basically make an extension to a general case. Okay, so let's begin by considering an elastic bar um, loaded with some stress that could vary with time. Okay, so let's begin by uh, consider uh, an elastic bar okay, uh, with uh, some applied stress, okay, applied stress as a function of time. So what does that look like? Well, here's my, here's my bar, and it has some stress applied to it, sigma of t, and it has uh, a material property that we'll just call E the Young's modulus. Okay, so this is a pretty easy problem. Back to your your sophomore or freshman mechanics of materials class, we can easily write the strain response here, right? So uh, the strain response for this case is going to be given as follows. Okay, so we can write uh, epsilon of t, uh, and and we can write define the strain response just by Hooke's law, right? So uh, epsilon is going to equal uh, sigma divided by E. Okay, let's call that equation one. So now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this bar, instead of being elastic, let's look at the viscoelastic case, okay? So let's consider the same problem but now for a viscoelastic bar, okay? But uh, for a viscoelastic material, right, we now have the tools to solve that, okay? So here, the strain response is what? Uh, is, and instead of Hooke's law now, we're gonna use our hereditary integral. So the strain response there is gonna be epsilon of t uh, is gonna be equal to the integral from 0 to t of the creep compliance j times t minus c times sigma dot, which is a function of c dc. Right? Call that equation 2. Now what I want to do is take the Laplace transform of each equation. Okay, so, uh, so taking the Laplace transform of 1 and 2, Right, we write that for the elastic case, what do we have? So in the case of the elastic, that's equation one. Well, that just says epsilon bar is equal to one over E times sigma bar, right? Let's call that equation three. Pretty straightforward. How about for the viscoelastic case? Okay, so the viscoelastic case, um, left-hand side still is epsilon bar is equal to, now the right hand side, this is a convolution integral, right? That convolution integral looks like, uh, if we take the Laplace transform of that, looks like j bar times sigma dot bar, right? Remember our rule for derivatives? So sigma dot bar is just s times sigma bar. So it's j bar s times sigma bar. And we'll call that equation four. 
Okay. Now, remember, uh, in, a, in a previous lecture, we, we derived the relationship between the creep compliance J and the, the relaxation modulus Y, right, in, in the Laplace transform space. So I'll just say recall uh, the relationship um, uh, between uh, J bar and Y bar. Right, and what was that relationship? Well, when we multiplied them together, we said that j bar times y bar was equal to 1 over s squared. So we can write that j bar s, which is what we see here, is equal to 1 over a y bar s. Okay, let's call that equation 5. So now I'm going to substitute equation 5 into equation 4. So substitute uh, 5 into 4 uh, to get that now epsilon bar is equal to uh, 1 over uh, y bar s uh, times sigma bar. Okay, let's call that equation 6. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to compare equation 3 and equation 6. Okay, so let's just do that. Uh, so compare uh, equation 3 and equation 6. What do we see? Well, we see that for this problem at least, in Laplace transform space, um, the viscoelastic solution is identical to the elastic solution if we just change out Young's modulus for this y bar s term. Okay, so it's identical uh, to the elastic solution uh, with uh, Young's modulus E um, replaced by uh, uh, y bar s. Okay, where obviously y bar is the Laplace transform of the relaxation modulus. Okay, so this is an example. It's not a proof, but it's an example of a general principle that we're going to call the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle. Okay, uh, this is an example. Note that it's not a proof, right? Uh, of a general principle uh, called the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle. Okay, and that's, all, that's kind of a mouthful. So I'm going to abbreviate that throughout the rest of this lecture as the EVCP, the Elastic Viscoelastic Correspondence Principle. Okay, so it can, I'm going to give you the general steps for applying this principle uh, to problems that you can already solve elastically. Okay, so here we go. Okay, the EV CP, the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle, um, can be applied to viscoelastic problems in the following steps. Okay, step one. Step one is solve the corresponding elastic problem for whatever properties you want. Okay, so solve the corresponding elastic problem uh, for the desired quantities. Okay, step two. Take the Laplace transform of the visco of the elastic solution. So take the Laplace transform of the elastic solution. Step three: replace Young's modulus E with either S times y bar or one over S j bar. Okay. So replace Young's modulus E uh, in the Laplace transform solution uh, with s y bar or the equivalent 1 over uh, s j bar okay step four solve for any additional quantities that you want in terms of laplace transform variables okay solve for any additional quantities okay in terms of the laplace transform variables step five Take the inverse Laplace transform uh, to get the solution in the time domain. So take the inverse 
Laplace transform uh, to get the solution uh, in the time domain. Okay? Now, let me make a remark. One of the key features of, of applying any principle to a class of problems is knowing when you can and when you can't do it. Um, so I'm going to give you a very careful definition. So uh, it's easy to misunderstand uh, when this can be applied and when it can't be applied. So just pay particular attention here. Let me give you the remark. Okay, here's the remark regarding this. The elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle is going to be valid when. Okay, so it's valid if and only if, so uh, if and only if the boundaries uh, between the traction boundary uh, set, okay, or domain, so the traction boundary domain, which I'll uh, uh, denote as gamma sub t, and the displacement boundary domain, which I'll denote as gamma u, okay? So the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle is valid if and only if the boundaries between the traction boundary domain, gamma t, and the displacement boundary domain, uh, gamma u, are independent of time. That's the key. So let me, let me, let me say why it be, can become confusing. Okay, the, the loads where we're applying the tractions, those can vary in time, and the displacements can vary in time, either or. What can't vary is the domain over which they're applied. That can't vary in time. The, the, the domains must remain the same, okay? So let me, let me just write that as a note, a way to be a little bit more specific. Um, so just the boundary conditions themselves uh, can vary in time. Okay, but the boundary location or the interface between them cannot. Okay, boundary location, or think of that as the interface that, that uh, separates the traction and displacement boundaries, it cannot vary in time. Okay, so that you might think is as clear as mud. So let me give you an illustration. Okay, so here's an illustration that will help you. Uh, determine and and uh, highlight what I'm talking about. So let me first uh, give you an example of when the the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle is valid. Okay, so here's the valid case. Let's consider uh, indenting a material. Okay, so here is some surface. Okay, I'm going to bring down a cylindrical indenter onto that surface something like this, and it's going to come down with some force, okay, and it's going to, if I were to now draw, I'm going to now, this is a, obviously a, a side view of a problem that is a, it's a, a cylinder, the cylinder makes a boundary, looks like that, looking down on it, okay, so the cylinder comes down, it's pushing on this surface, and it can, makes this connection here. As we push down, this surface must go down with the cylinder, so it's a displacement boundary condition. Okay, So this red surface in there, that is, I'll say, gamma u. Okay, The surface of the material that's not in contact, that's going to be a traction equals zero boundary condition, so that's... Uh, gamma t, and this circle represents the interface, right? So let's say that this is happening all uh, now at so at uh, time t is equal to t1, okay? Okay, so now at some later time, this material has, has uh, deformed as the indenter has come down. So let's say it, it's deformed down to this region right here, okay? Something like that, right? Okay, so if it's done that, okay, and here's our indenter coming down, still applying a force, and if I were to project this down, okay, I have the exact same interface, right? So this interface still is uh, 
gamma u and then this interface here is still gamma t and this is for some time uh, t greater than t1 right so in this case what does this system looks like so it has we have a fixed interface right between uh, gamma t and gamma u right uh, it, with time that is right it doesn't change so the interface between uh, the displacement boundary and the traction boundary stays the same throughout there now let's look at a counter example where the the elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle is not valid okay so let's look at that case so let's let's continue on with our indenting problem so we have a surface here except now instead of being a cylindrical indenter we're going to indent it with a spherical indenter something like that okay and maybe we're at the initially at time t equals t1 our interface is very small right it only makes contact something like that so this is our contact region something like that uh, same problem here this is uh, our displacement boundary condition this is our traction boundary condition okay and this is still at t equals t1 let's look at what happens now at some time t greater than t1 uh, where oops let me put this there's a force pushing down uh, now that force is pushed down a little bit right so so there's my now my spherical indenter still with a force pushing down but now my material looks like this okay something like that so here's my new boundary not well it's not new it's still my traction boundary and now let me project down my my interface between the traction and the displacement boundary right so there's my displacement boundary so now that's my new interface as I look down on it so you can see that the the uh, the interface uh, between the traction boundary and the displacement boundary grew with time okay so the interface in this case the interface uh, between uh, gamma t and gamma u um, changes with time okay so obviously uh, in both cases right the boundary condition let's say on delta on gamma u is changing uh, but in, in this case it's okay because the boundary doesn't change in this case uh, the boundary condition on gamma u is changing but it's not valid because the the um, boundary itself is growing in time okay so that kind of is trying to illustrate when it's when we can use this principle versus when we can't okay so uh, that that sort of sets up the general principle um, uh, in, the, in the next lecture we're gonna uh, give a specific example for a beam bending problem and show how we can apply this uh, in, 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 a, in a simple example